Hi, it's me, James Lott Jr., and you're about to watch, or if you're listening, listen to my interview with Jennifer Bassey, the legendary Emmy-winning Jennifer Bassey. Uh, we had some technical difficulties for some reason throughout the interview, but there's some we did, I did some editing, I did the best I could, but I left some stuff in because there's some really great stuff in it. Jennifer is open and warm and honest and wonderful and has some great stories. And so I apologize for some of the glitches, but we, I took so I took a lot more out. But I, I kept some of the stuff in because it's really some really good stuff. You can check her out at the on Kombucha Cure, which starts February twenty first. Popstar TV, you get the app, or go to Popstar TV on your well, your TV, your local listings, where it is, and check out season one. Um, I believe it's going to be uh, an episode a week. I believe so. Go check that out. Check her out in it. I'm sure she's amazing as always. Um, but thank you for watching the show. And now here we go to the, the wonderful interview. Okanook. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the All My Children After Show here on JLJ Media. And I'm James Lodge, your host. And of course, I'm here with my friend, of course, who has a new series coming out Tuesday, February 21st on Popstar TV, Kakambucha Cure. We're going to talk about what she, who she plays, what that's about. Uh, we talked to some of the other stars of the show already, so we're going to find out what she's doing on the show, what she can tell us, of course, not get in trouble. And I talked to some all my children, but she is my friend, and I'm so happy to be united with her, the legendary Jennifer Bassey. Hello, Miss Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> now, listen, I have a thing in front of me that says, get it. Do I click on it? It says what? It says this meeting is being oh, yeah. oh, yeah. recorded yeah. by the yeah. host. Yeah, say got it or yeah or something like that. Yeah. Say get it. Okay. okay. <laughs> I got it. You have to tell me everything, darling, because I'm over 10. You know? <laughs> yes, you're 15. I uh, love it. That's right, so. darling. You got it. <laughs> so how are you, Mr. Ever? How have you been? Well, I'm doing well considering. I um I was I do a two-mile walk every day in Central Park. And every once in a while through my life, my left leg has collapsed for no reason from under me. Mm. And I usually can grab a railing or a, a, a chair or my yeah. apartment or something. Unfortunately, this time it collapsed under me on the walk bridal trail in Central Park. So I, I, I didn't trip or anything. I just went down like a tree. And I broke my shoulder in four places. So they took me to the emergency room and said, you have to wait eight days, which I have to tell you, it was the most excruciating eight days of my entire life. Before we operate, so the swelling will go down. I said, I don't care. Just kill me. Just inject me. I can't live with this pain. So right. so I finally get a brand new shoulder put in. And Ooh, I'm good. going to physical therapy and I'm behaving myself. But I feel a strange thing uh, behind one of my front teeth, which were crowns. And yeah. so I went yeah. to my favorite dentist who I've known forever. And so I'm sitting in the dentist and the dentist comes in and looks at my x-rays and he goes out and then he brings another dentist in and they both go, oh, oh. And I go, oh, please God, you know, I broke my shoulder. I'm in physical therapy, now what? Yeah. Well, Jennifer, did you hit your face when you fell? I said, no. He said, well, you must have bitten down so hard you cracked all front four teeth are going to have to drill them off and then we found out we had to do a root canal. And then we found out we had to do a post. And these are temporaries. These are all temporary oh, right. teeth right now. Yeah. Yeah. And honey, this is the most expensive steel shoulder that anyone has ever got in their lives. You're so the bionic the, the woman. You're the bionic hair woman. Hair looks maybe a little. I I'm a bionic woman, baby. And I can't even comb my I'm I'm, you know, I'm in physical therapy. So, yeah, and I'm in the middle of doing a, a one-woman show and a nightclub act. So this stopped everything dramatically. Everything dramatically. Your life changes in one second. Yes. When you this happens to you. Yes. So you're so so you're doing you're about to do a one-woman show. Yeah, I, I you know Francesca James. Yes, yes, of course, yeah, legendary. Well, Francesca and James. for the yes. people who are listening, Francesca James is the only person really who has won Emmys in three categories, acting, producing, and directing. Directing, yeah. And she got me on all my children. Yeah. And um, now why am I bringing this up? Because you just asked me something. The woman with the show. The woman show. You're so doing. Francesca was up for, for lunch when I was in my, you know, I couldn't even eat and everything with Louise Sorrell. Oh, my girl. I love Louise. Oh, I love her. Yes. And Judy Wilson, who's won awards everywhere for casting. Okay. Yes. 
Yeah. They're my three friends and they come up for lunch and I start telling them stories of my disastrous career because it has been disastrous. I mean, not the whole career, but right. I mean, look, for instance, for instance, I'm the only person in all the unions, in all the world who has won an Emmy and they didn't give it to me. I know. Now, oh, that I to me is shocking. That. I remember yeah, that. I went, and so my friend Richard Esposito, who was the hairdresser uh, for, um, uh, you know, oh my God, 30 Rock. Yeah. And he was our hairdresser on All My Children. He's sending me one of his because I, he called me the other day. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm buying an Emmy. And he said, well, what? And he said, well, because I won one and they didn't give you give me it. He said, I, I know, darling. He said, listen, why don't I just send you one of mine? Then you don't have to buy I'm getting my Emmy, which I'm, can you hear? Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, you're fine. You run out. So folks, just bear with us. We go through this. So, okay. So, well, congratulations on the One Woman Show. I mean, it, it'll, it'll be great once you finally get to it. It'll be great. Um, yeah, it'll be, it'll be great. And 54 Below is a great place to see shows. Um, it's a great place to, in New York, folks. It's a great place to see shows. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. I oh mean, yeah, it's fabulous. yeah, yeah, great place to see shows. Um, so how did you get this role in Kabucha Cure? Well, uh, Jasper, who you know yeah. and love, love. Uh, my, love. Jasper's my manager, by the way, to all right. of you who are maybe listening someday soon. Uh. And um, he had an audition for me in New York and it was for a Hungarian woman. And she was, it was a delightful part. And I thought, I like this part, you know, because I have to fly to LA, you know, to do things when he yeah. gets me something in LA, you know. And so it has to be worth my while to do something that I like. And so, um, and then I called a friend of mine who's Hungarian and she taught me a certain vowel sound. So I did a Hungarian accent when I did the part. And so, you know, you, you, um, I sent in a tape, you know, you say company instead of company and you say lot. Um, you say wise instead of wise, you know, so I taught myself some vowels and I sent it in. It didn't call for one, but I thought, well, her parents, emigrated from Hungary, so she, she must have an accent, and she, she must have been speaking Hungarian for the first five years of her life before she went to school in America. So I did the Hungarian accent, and the next thing I know, they said, well, you're very much in the running for this, and I said, okay, that's great. And then they said, you've got the part, and I said, oh, that's wonderful, and, and you have to be in LA for a month, so I called a close friend, Melanie Martin, and I stayed with her, and um, that's how it happened. And it was a great group of people. Our director, who was from Korea, as you know, um, uh, was delightful. She's a, a doctor um, who is anti-pharmaceutical. Let's yes. put it that way. Yes. Heavily yes. anti-pharmaceutical. Yes. So, yeah, so so that's what happened. And when I got out there, they said, do that fabulous Hungarian accent you did. <laughs> Played it with an Hungarian accent. So... That's what happened. I love it. And folks, so this this is a dark comedy. So as she mentions the real life creator and writer of this, the show is going to be touching upon this kind of stuff. Um, and so I think it's one of those things where we see a lot of these kinds of shows on TV. They're a lot of fun to watch. And there'll be some messages, I'm sure, in the show as we're laughing and seeing the drama and the comedy, I'm sure. Yeah, oh, I'll get stuff. Okay, um, that's that's yeah, that's that's hilarious. Yeah, I just said until, just until. Um, we love what we well, do, darling. Right. Until. <laughs> How about you? Are you going to work until? I think so. I think I. I think that's, until I can wheel, have to wheel me off. I okay, love honey. Talk. That's right. That's why we do it. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Exactly. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do this. So yes, um, you know exactly. And I'll, exactly. Until they, until they say you exactly. can't be, then I'll, then I'll go. Then I'll, then I'll just bye bye everybody, and that's it. Oh my goodness, that is hilarious. Um, I want to ask you now some a couple of things about, <laughs> about all my children. Next thing. 
So as what you know, about it? as we as you look back at some of the storylines you had, I wonder if you have fresher eyes on it. So like I want to start with so I feel like Mary and Colby had several stints. Um, and we'll start with the earliest one, the big popular one with Tad the Cad, daughter Liza, Marion. It was very yeah. soapy. It was very soapy. It was very, you know, it was it was a big deal. No, it wasn't very soapy. I was the first cougar on in the country. I was gonna mention it that. They, you at all. It was an older woman with a younger man. It was very innovative. Yeah. You know, uh because as we all know, older women do have younger men. <laughs> they do. Yes, they do. I gave you I gave you a little Mary in there. I gave you a little I Mary did. Oh, you did. Oh, yeah, you yeah. did. But I mean, when we look back well, on Carol Burnett, Carol, what honey? Well, go ahead. No, please go ahead. Carol Burnett. Go, go ahead. Carol Burnett was interviewed. Uh, she watched from beginning to end, and she said her favorite story out of all was Tad and Marianne and Liza. Mine too. Mine too. It, it was very, it was written very, very well. And, and, uh, uh, and Marcy is a brilliant act, not only a good actor, but a very funny human being. And who I really, really love. I love both of them. And so, yeah, it was a, a wonderful thing. And I was only supposed to stay on for three months. And, and I met our producer, Jackie Babin, who said, I'm going to Bali for three uh, three weeks and I'll be back. I'll see you then. And I didn't even read for the part. She just said, you're playing the part. And uh, so I, I went, oh, you know, and they were doing major comedy then, yes. major. Everybody on all my toe who used to leave his, you know, he'd sign with his paws for his fan mail, you know, I mean, it was like, and everything was funny. And I was lethally horrible, lethally horrible. You know, I reacted to Cape Blanchett's performance um, in, um, what is it called? Tar. Yeah. I mean, I hated her so much. I wanted to stab her. I wanted to stab the screen. I hated her so much. And that's how people reacted to me. They, yes. they, threw, to me, they threw tomatoes at me. They um, uh, called me names. And one person slapped me in the face and said, you adulterous bitch. So I thought, well, this is a dangerous role. This is a very dangerous role I'm playing. Yeah. So I decided I was playing. Um, I did a lot of Broadway shows in the 70s and 80s. And 60s. And um, um, I did uh, The Homecoming on Broadway. And Harold Pinter, who wrote The Homecoming, oh. writes in very sexual pauses. Everything is, even when you meet him and you say, oh, uh, Mr. Pinter, I like your suit. He said, thank you very much. It's a Saint Laurent. And I go, Jesus. I mean, that man is <laughs> sexy you know so anyway i had a speech in the play on broadway uh and i asked when i got the job i said well what does the play mean they said we don't know and harold doesn't know none of us know i said well you're kidding me and I, you know you, you have to tell me what it's about she said we don't and i'm just so you just I play it like you want. So nobody, and even the audience never figures it out because we don't know what we're doing. So how are they going to know what we're doing? But here, <laughs> yeah, I love it. I do. Now later, but then later, they kind of switched gears and gave you Stuart Chandler. The magic of David. Well, Kennedy. that was very, very late. Yeah. That was Francesca. She was producing and directing. And the head writer thought, it would be very funny if I thought I slept with with uh, um, Adam, but I really slept with Stuart. And I have to say that David Canary was an angel. David Canary was one of the sweetest people, kind to everybody, and he was a brilliant actor. And they put us together, and we just ran with it. We just had a blast. Yeah. And we were voted to the most favorite couple for the first time in history of soap opera. Anybody over 40 was voted most favorite couple in the history of, of soaps. Yeah. And and that gave her an idea to write for um, 
one life to live, Erica Slezak, she was, they put her with a younger man, maybe 20 years younger, and they, and they won favorite did. couple the next year. Yeah, they did. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, it opened the door to older characters, you know, because we are in an ageism country, especially where you live. And if you, you know, 30 year olds are getting facelifts. So, you know, there's a problem where they live. If 30 years old had to look 25. Yes. You know. Right. I mean, pretty soon babies are going to have their eyelids lifted. So they look three instead of five, you know, in Los Angeles. Uh, <laughs> don't get me started on the ageism. Just don't get me started on ageism. Um, but, uh, you know, it. It's, um, it's what it is. Yeah. It's what we're dealing with today. You know, yeah, it is. And that's no, like, I still, go ahead. Uh, I was saying because, again, Dave Canary and you created magic as Stuart and Marion. I mean, it was it was magic. It was light. It was lightning in a bottle. Megan McTavish. She wrote that storyline, and she was brilliant. You know, she was brilliant. And it was written beautifully. I mean, funny and moving. And it just, I mean, I never, I've never, i never had more fun. That was my favorite. Well, when I first started, I loved the story I was doing. But basically, uh, working with David and under those conditions and marrying him on the show was just a blast. Yeah. It was so much fun. I mean, it was just, I couldn't wait to get to work because I was having a great time. And that's what work should be. It should be fun. Like you like what you're doing. You have fun with what you're doing. I do. And if you don't have fun with what you're doing, pick up your sandals and move on and find something you like to do. <laughs> that's my philosophy. It's, no, mine too. And I too. And I, but I think I just, all my children had so many, you know, I've been talking, I'm friends with many of your former castmates and I talked to many, just, it had a wealth of talented people behind the scenes. And oh, we had great actors. Great we had great actors on our show. Amazing. Really. Amazing. And if we had an actor that was problematic, they left immediately. Nobody that. caused trouble. Nobody caused trouble. Everybody was there to support one another and work. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's how it and that's how it stayed. And I worked on other programs that were like, are you kidding? Are you kidding me? <laughs> you know. Yes, we know, right? I mean, they were so difficult. Yes, yes. Uh, do you? Oh, miss, please. Do so, you miss? Do you yeah. miss the? Do you miss the pacing of soap opera acting? Oh God, no! God, no! Are you crazy? Have you ever spent a day on a set of a soap opera? Yeah. Have you ever done that and gotten up and gotten to the? Yeah, then you would know. Okay, yeah, I have, movies I have. they do seven pages a day on television. Times we do a hundred and forty or hundred and fifty pages a day. Now, how much fun is that? Ooh, and know? what? I mean, what, one, soap opera stars and soap actors are the hardest workers in the entire medium. Yes. You get up, you get there, and it's like instant coffee. You got to deliver it and move on to the next. There's no time. There's no time. And the lighting is the worst lighting I have ever seen in my entire life. And I am really aware of lighting. I, you've got to know that. I mean, yeah. I am. Yeah. Kelly Rippa, Kelly Rippa said to me one day, I said, uh, Kelly, don't stand there. She said, why? I said, I can't see you on the camera. You're in such darkness. Well, what should I do? I said, move to find a light. They'll criticize me. I don't care. Move where there's light. That's what I did. You know, they would put me in a spot here and I'd end up 10 feet away. And that director would say, what are you doing over there? I said, I have light over here. Thank you. And every time I've done 42 years since the 60s of soap opera. Yeah. And every time I'm stopped in the street, they said, you're much prettier in person. That shouldn't be. That shouldn't be. Yeah. The lighting is so bad. You look 100 years older than you are. So not only is it exhausting, not only is it difficult and, and now they're more and more into money, money, money they say money so you know, you're know, cramming more pages into one day uh, lighting is horrible and you look bad well what's fun about that oh. I mean it's very hard work, if you're working but but no, it's it's a bit, if you can do a soap opera you can do anything yeah. <laughs> you can do oh, anything yeah. Oh yeah, oh yes, that's very much so. Um, and I think people need to start really outside of the soap opera world 
need to recognize that. I think I think now it's starting to get some respect, some not a lot, but I think it's good ones, and there are some really bad ones. I mean, you look, so, you can learn some very bad tricks on soap opera. Mm. And I always tell, and I, those you've been nameless because one of them has become a big movie star. Yeah. And I said, I said, don't do this and go to this acting teacher. And he said, why? I said, because you're going to learn tricks. You don't want to learn tricks. I think you're going to be a big movie star. And this was a long, long time ago. And now he is a big movie star. But he went to an acting teacher who makes you so real. And he stayed real. Because when he started, he was young. And he was so good and so real. But I knew he was going to learn tricks. Because you have to, to get around what you're doing. Yeah. And um, so he came out of it and uh, and still retained that reality, that realness that he had in his work. So I always try to encourage young soap stars to keep studying, go to class, you know, do keep your razor blade sharp. You know, I'm still in class. I still go to class every week. Good. Well, you know, I think you're right. People, especially when you're in their homes five days a week, they know authenticity. They know they know bad acting. They know good acting. Like they the fans are dumb. They get it. They see it. The camera doesn't lie, right? The camera tells you everything, doesn't it? Yeah, I that there are some very good actors and some very bad actors. Yeah. You know, the, the primary thing on, on daytime is hire the most beautiful person you can find, you know, and that's what they do. Some of them are really good and some of them have to learn. I've seen people come in who were absolutely awful and three years later they won an Emmy. Yeah. And they were going to that teacher in New York that I was talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. His name is Alan Savage and he's just a wonderful teacher. And I said, well, what has she been doing? When she started on the show, she was awful. Now she's won an Emmy. Who is she working with? And they told me, and I started working with them. Because, you know, I I went to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, and I graduated top of my class with Anthony Hopkins. And I I learned a lot of technical things. I mean, like, look, I, I, I'm, I can cover my face. Now, do you want lying, uh, crying or laughing? And Laugh. here's... Laughing. Okay. You'll get both. Well, first, I'll give you crying and then I'll give you laughing. Okay. okay. Take all the vowels, A E I O U, because some people can't cry. They just can't. And I can cry. And you want which, which eye do you want the tear from? Ooh, you left. Know? Left. But I'm lucky. I'm lucky. But okay, so watch. So it goes. <laughs> Okay, I did A-E-I-O-U. That's all I did, A-E-I-O-U. And uh, it sounded real. Yeah. Yeah, so you can do the same. I mean, what does your character, what vowel does your character laugh on? I laugh on, ah, ha, ha, like I've heard a good dirty joke. So none of my characters that I play do I go, ah, ha, ha, you know, because that's not how they would laugh. They would either laugh on, <laughs> or, <laughs> Or, you know, but they wouldn't laugh, ha ha, you know, because that's how I laugh. And when I was yeah. at school, they said, listen to her. She has a raucous laugh, you know. Well, so I learned about technical stuff. I didn't learn about, um, you know, and getting away with like, you can get, get away with anything if you have a good technique. Yeah. But but getting to a good teacher who grounds you and, and makes you more and more real all the time, that is brilliant that is brilliant people always want me want me to ask people who are in business for a long time on this subject so i'm going to ask you cue cards back in the day what were your thoughts on cue cards cue cards oh i never read them i just made things up but <laughs> uh because we, you, you could really mess up people you know um Oh gosh, what's his name? Palmer Cortland. What was his real name? Oh yeah. Uh, oh my God. Uh, J uh, uh, oh my God. James yeah, James. Mitchell. Yeah, James, James Mitchell. James Mitchell. James Mitchell. Yes. Okay. James Mitchell would walk around his set, and he would put a piece of paper over here on on the fireplace, and then he put a piece of paper on the side table, and then he put a piece of paper on a desk, and they were all, all in the order when he would be there moving around and so what we would do is change all of his notes around right before taping 
And then, so he'd walk over to the fireplace and he'd say, Erica, what? <laughs> <laughs> he'd walk over, well, who messed up my, you know? And, and, you know, so we used to play games on each other all the time. Yes. Ruth, War Ruth Warwick once flashed the whole company in a fur coat with nothing under it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had, we had we had a lot of laughs. Let me tell you, we had a lot of laughs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know some people. I know some folks were relying on them. Some folks didn't like them. I took certain actors like, oh, I hated them. I was not into them. I thought, well, I mean, it's a lot of dialogue. I don't know. I guess I least for some. Well, uh, you know, my my husband, who I'm married to now, he's a, he's a playwright and an actor, and he had such a grand. Uh, 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 idea of himself at years ago when he got a soap opera. So he decided he would read the cue cards for years ago. Can you still hear me? I hear you. Can you hear me? I hear you. Okay. So he uh, he read the whole thing, which was not very good, of course, because he's looking right at the cue card. And as he was leaving, he heard two uh, uh, people who were cameramen or something, crew members, he said, that's got to be the worst actor I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> you know? Oh my God. Because it's obvious when you're reading a cue card. I mean, it's very awkward to someone who wasn't good. And nobody, could, and some people couldn't read them. They, they were nearsighted. You know, I'm farsighted, but some people would go, you know, they go, they couldn't read them. So that, that was not good. Not good. <laughs> oh my God. Jennifer, thank you for your time. You're always a delight to talk to. You. And I want you to have your Emmy. Shit. I want you to have it. I want you to have it. Give her, her give her the give me the give her that Emmy. Give it to her. No, the what? Oh, the what? The Emmy. I want you to have your Emmy. I want you to have it. Oh, I'm gonna photograph it and, and, and send it to the Emmy people who didn't let me have it. Oh yes. Oh yes. And I'm, when I Die. I hope the New York Times will say she won an Emmy. You yes. know, I, I I want that included in my obit. Yes, I want it. Too. I mean, I don't want revenge. <laughs> you don't want revenge. On any of those <laughs> but I mean, I am the first person to win an Emmy who didn't get it. I know. I mean, this is unheard of. What the hell is wrong with those people? You know, there's a a lot. Got to be retards. A lot, a lot of stuff went down. I remember I called you. I sent your message that day. A lot of stuff went down. It was kind of crazy. It was a crazy time. So I'm glad. Yeah, you deserve your Emmy. I would give her her Emmy. I know I do. I know I do. Mm -hmm. It's just, but you know, that's why I'm writing a one woman show about my disastrous career. Yep. You know. <laughs> also, nobody has ever had a nude scene with an orangutan. You know, I mean, all my stuff I, that I've had is like one of a kind. <laughs> yes. Yes. And that's how life sometimes should be. One of a kind. That's who you are, Jennifer. We are one of a kind. So thank you so I, much. I send you so much love. Same here. Same here. Thank you so much. Thank you.